Give me the thumbs up, Gwen. Starting very soon. Don't let me know when that's come through. Mr. Green has it on his. Could you hear me? Yeah. Smashing. Uh, good evening. Uh, good afternoon, year 11. Uh, paper two, here we go. Uh, paper two tomorrow. It's an afternoon exam. You've got uh, Spanish, I think, in the morning. Um, before we get started, a little bit of feedback on paper one. I think, I think when we opened it, I, I, all, I think we all thought that that was absolutely fantastic paper, and it certainly was. There was lots of opportunities there for you to be getting down a lot of good geography to do with uh, polar bears. Then we had uh, the food chains. There was also the cave arch stack stump. There was the waterfall question as well, which was uh, I think some of you have done really, really well on. Um, I'm going to be giving you some hints and tips throughout um, this revision uh, presentation today uh, to sort of hopefully boost you a little bit even further. But without further ado, let, let's get started. The, the first section that you'll be completing in tomorrow's exam, section A, will be on urban issues and challenges. Now, in that element, we have taught you about Rio de Janeiro and we've also taught you about London. And it starts with this. We're looking at urban trends uh, across the world. Now, we've got two lines here. The first line is LICs, and the second line is HICs, high income countries. And on the left hand side here, we have urban population in billions. Now along the base, we have years. Now what I've done there, ladies and gents, is I've pulled out key information. I haven't just noted down the key, but I've also looked at what's on the left hand side of the axes and on the base as well. And quite clearly, we can see that LICs here have increased much more rapidly than the HICs. In fact, in around 1975-ish, LICs started to increase very, very quickly in terms of their urban population. Whereas HICs haven't really increased necessarily too much. There's just been a gentle um, sort of continuing line that is slowly increasing um, only from about just short of 0 0.5 billion people um, to just short of 1 billion people in, two, in the year 2000. There could quite happily be a, uh, sorry, quite easily be a descriptive question tomorrow um, that asks you to describe some sort of graph. Please don't necessarily just say that we can see that LICs have increased. Be specific. It increased slowly between the years 1950 and uh, 19, 1975 increasing from perhaps 0 0.3 billion to maybe 0 0.8 billion. Then it increased much more rapidly from 0 0.8 billion to about 1.5 billion. You've been really specific there. Um, so why are LICs and NEEs newly emerging economies? 
Why are these growing so quickly? And the first reason is jobs. We can see all sorts of different employment here. People are moving to the urban areas and LICs and NEEs, number one, because of jobs. They're also going, number two, because of educational opportunities within the urban areas. Remember here, urban meaning city or town. Then we have housing. There's much better housing in a city, housing opportunities for people to live. Um, there is transport, so it's actually easy to move to a city now in some of these countries which are developing slowly. And finally, number five, access to clean water. These five reasons, one, two, three, four, and five, are five reasons why people would want to move to cities in LICs and NEEs. Now I've got, a, I've got a star here, it says there's an opportunity to demonstrate a clear understanding in the exam. If it does ask why or what are the pull factors towards cities in urban areas and LICs, don't just tell me jobs, link it. Jobs, therefore people can earn an income. Or education, therefore people can get qualifications, therefore they can get a better job and then that then would link back to income. You might say clean water, people move for clean water, then that's going to reduce their chances of getting diseases such as cholera. Have I spelled that right? Cholera, there we go. Um, but my question to you then is, are these really the reasons why people are moving to cities in HICs? Bearing in mind, we're an example of a HIC, are people moving to cities in HICs because of jobs, because of education, because of better housing? Well, no, we're not because we have decent housing in rural areas. People in rural areas also can get a good education. And we know that in rural areas in our country, people have access to clean water. So. If we go back to this graph at the very start and we look at HICs, HICs aren't necessarily urbanising at the same rate as LICs. And that's a bit strange because surely there must have been a point when we were urbanised and all of a sudden it started to increase. And it comes to this photo here. People moved to cities in the UK during this period of time. It was during the 1800s, during the Industrial Revolution. During the 1800s, in the UK, there were rivers. And factories were built next to rivers. So that boats could transport materials away to different countries. As a result, People moved towards these factories and cities developed then. And that's when they were moving for jobs. Now, that happened during the 1800s. And in LICs and NEEs, that's only been happening more recently as they've begun to develop. So this process is now happening in HICs. It's called counter urbanization. Bearing in mind, urbanization, just urbanization on its own, is the proportion of people living in towns and cities. Now, this has already happened in HICs. Now we're getting counter-urbanisation. Counter is the end of the opposite, so now it's changing. Fewer people are living in towns and cities than HICs, and it's because of this. Number one, transport. It is possible in HICs for people not to live in a city, but just to work there, and they commute in. This one, number two, it's overcrowded. Cities are becoming so busy now, people prefer to live in the rural countryside. You can also have large houses in the countryside. So people would prefer to have houses beautiful like this outside of the city and then move in. Number four, litter and crime. 
it's a little bit dirty in some cities now and people don't necessarily like that and finally some parts of it are derelict but again ladies and gents we have another opportunity here to develop our answer it's great to say why does counter counter urbanization happen because of transport because of overcrowding but take it that little bit further in your exam overcrowding therefore transport like the tube is busy so people don't want that perhaps a larger house so people can have a family with a front and back garden and their, ch and their children can play in the garden you've developed that idea you already know it so tell the examiner that's how you're going to get into level two what is natural increase very simply if we take any country or place and we look at the number of births, let's say in one example in the UK today, there were 100 people that were born. But sadly, today in the UK, 80 people died. That would mean the natural increase here would be 20. It is the difference between the number of births and the number of deaths. Please bear in mind on this example that it could be negative. Let's say in some countries where the population might be declining, maybe 100 people died and 80 people were born. Therefore, the natural increase that day would be minus 20. Megacities, you know, is a city with more than 10 million people in. And we noticed on paper one, that there wasn't really a describing the distribution question necessarily. There wasn't glaciers, but we didn't teach you glaciers. So there may be perhaps a distribution question where they show you a map similar to this. It might not have to do with megacities. It could be to do with something totally different. But what I'm about to say is you can apply to any sort of map where you are describing the distribution. When we are describing the distribution, things to look out for look at what we can see on here we can see cities you may be shown a map that shows countries you may be given a compass to work with as well you may even have lines such as the equator on there to try catch you out might say also continent so when we're looking at this map here quite clearly we can see there's a lot of mega cities around this part of the world and hopefully some of us know that this is Asia and that this is China. I'm not going to write it on, but this part's China and this section here, here, that is India. So straight away, I would be picking out here and saying that the distribution, and if you, we use compass directions as well, in southeast China, one point would be in south east China, there are lots of mega cities we can see can't we however compare that to africa there look at the entirety of africa compared to only two in africa there are only two in the continent of africa and you might be really specific and say lagos is one of them in nigeria which we'll be coming to later so you've actually picked something out of that map to describe that distribution we can see that there's a few popping up in Europe. So you might say a few in Europe. And then if you're really, really good, you might say west of Europe. This is in a westerly direction. West of Europe, we can see there is New York on the east coast of the USA. And on the west coast of the USA is Los Angeles, LA. South of LA, you have Mexico City. Now, hopefully you can hear what I'm saying in my voice there. I'm actually using compass directions throughout and referring to different countries and places. So I started in Europe and then I didn't say North America. I said west of Europe, you've got New York on the east side of USA. On the west side of USA, you have LA. But the majority of them are in South China and in Southern India. So 
We've taught you about Rio de Janeiro. That is an NEE that is experiencing urban change. Now, Rio de Janeiro, look where it is. It is part of Brazil. And if we were to use compass directions again there, we would note that it is on the south east coast of Brazil. And this ocean is called the Atlantic Ocean, which is very, very important for Rio's development. It says, how does Rio's position in Brazil accelerate, speed up, its urban growth. Well, we've already learned previously in Nigeria in the causes of uneven development. If you live on a coast, that enables you to trade. It enables you to trade, which means Rio must have quite a few ports where it can trade in and out its goods with other parts of the world. And that is one main reason why the urban growth in Rio has been so significant. So what opportunities are there there? What would make people want to go and live in Rio de Janeiro? And this comes back to your pull and push factors. We've seen this photo already. Number one, jobs. Develop your answer. Do not just say jobs. You might say jobs. We know in Rio specifically there are jobs in construction. This would provide people with an income. Number two, Education, that provides people with lots of good qualifications. Why? Of course you'd want to move there then. If that means people have got qualifications, that means they can get a better job, that means they can get a better income, that means they can pay more tax and then contribute to uh, education and healthcare. There's better housing. Have you noticed how these pull factors are the exact same as what we saw before? And finally, clean water and transport. That's the, they're the opportunities created if people want to move there. But imagine that. Imagine if this is a population graph of Rio. So you have population up the side, and then this is time. What we are seeing to Rio's population is this. It's not just increasing slowly, it's starting to increase exponentially. That means faster and faster and faster. And because it's increasing exponen exponentially, imagine that. Imagine if all of a sudden one day in your school, in your house, in wherever you live, there was just hundreds and hundreds of more people. Think about what problems that might cause. The first one is you're going to get inequality. You're going to have lots of rich people and lots of poor people. That's going to mean some people have to live in these things called favelas. You might also then have this. Where's everyone going to work? This is called the informal economy. People have moved there for jobs, but perhaps there's no jobs left. So people start doing like this gentleman's doing, selling fruit, sunglasses, maybe shoe shiners, even things like the drug trafficking trade, which we know is already illegal, but actually all of these things are illegal because they don't pay tax. So you've got an increase in population with people doing jobs which aren't paying tax. That means that there's not going to be enough money for education or healthcare. A really, really big challenge for Rio. You've got this, which is pacification. And these two link. Because if we take pacification here, which I'll highlight for you, and drug trafficking, the challenge created is more people enter the drug trade to earn an income that creates gang warfare within the favelas. Therefore, the government are having to employ these specially trained teams. And this process is called pacification, where these police forces go into a favela to try clear out the, good, uh, the drug gang lords to make it safe. Pacifying it, it's to do with settling peace. If you've got an increasing population, if the population's doing this, population, there's going to be pressure on healthcare. If you get ill, 
the hospital's going to be well busy and there's going to be a lack of water for everybody. Where's it all going to come from? And also, imagine your classrooms at school. There's going to be educational pressures. People will not be able to fit inside classrooms. And imagine that. Imagine if I was teaching a lesson, not just to 30 students, but to 90 or 100 or even 200 people. The education you're going to get is not going to be as good. So, you need to be aware of the social challenges which we've just been through, but particularly how uh, Rio are trying to solve these. So, we've just outlined that healthcare is an issue. We know that if there's loads of people, look at that, only 55% of people have access to healthcare in Rio because the population's growing so quickly. So, what have they done? They've built a cable car to the city. Well, you can say it or you can explain it. A cable car to the city so people can access health centres in the centre. Because that's predominantly where they're going to be. Look at that. Education. There's not enough schools and teachers. So what are they doing? They're simply asking for volunteers to come and help. And I'll come back to this one later when we talk about the Favela Barrio project. And look at that water supply. 12% of Rio's population don't have access to running water. This is a great fact to know. So what they've done is they've laid 300 kilometers of new pipes. Ladies and gents, please say a little bit more than that. Outline exactly what that does. That will provide people with clean water And that means, then you can say, reduces diseases such as cholera. And if you do that, that is a superb answer. That will definitely be pushing you into top level two, even in level three, if it's a nine mark question. Finally, energy demand is exceeding supply. They don't, uh, demand is exceeding supply, sorry. They don't have enough energy to go around, so they are building a new nuclear generator to try and meet that demand. You need to do the same for environmental challenges. Remember, let's go back to that population. You can look at the pictures while I'm drawing this out. If this is the population graph, we know the population of Rio is going up like this. Now think about the impact that that's going to have on the environment. We've got lots of congestion there. Please don't just say congestion, you know exactly what it means. And look at that there, the impact on water. So, whoa. What are you going to talk about? You're going to say the traffic congestion causes air pollution. You might then even develop that. That means there's going to be more CO2 in the atmosphere. That might increase breathing difficulties. You might even be really good and say something like asthma or bronchitis. So what are they doing? Well, they're expanding the metro system. This is the public transport system. They're expanding it. Well, say exactly what that means. And so if they've got more public transport, there are fewer cars polluting. Well, how's, how is that then a solution? Well, it's a solution because that means there will be fewer people with breathing difficulties, reducing the impact on the healthcare system, on, oh, my pen stopped working, on the healthcare system, HCS. But I'm gonna clean that now because I need to show you something else. There's also water pollution. Look at that photo there. All that water polluted. So what are they doing? They're building new sewage works. Because if we've got cleaner water, fewer aquatic, ecosystems will be destroyed. Superb, what more do you want? You might even just simply say fish. 
Waste pollution in favelas. If we go back to that photo here, where are we? There. Look at that photo of favelas. Think about all the waste that's going to be created here. So what are they doing to try combat that? Simply, the building power plants and the killing two birds with one stone here, they're building power plants to generate more electric, but also they're gonna burn all that rubbish. What's gonna fuel it? Not coal, not wood, but the burning, rotting, they're gonna burn the rotting rubbish from the favelas. How superb is that? It's amazing. I know. Moving on. This question says, what is your example of an urban planning scheme. Now I've banged on about this in lesson as have the other teachers. In the exam, we will be very, very unlikely to see them say, talk about the Favela Barrier Project, something along those lines. They would be using this key terminology, urban planning scheme. And the one you have learned about is called the Favela Barrio Project. That was a scheme that was used to develop and improve living conditions. They wanted to enhance the living conditions in the favelas of Brazil. Just a little bit of background as to why they did that. If I attempt to draw a sketch here, here are some of the mountains in Brazil. Um, and here is, here's the water, here's the coastline. And finally, here's the story. So what happened in Brazil is Brazil bid for the Olympic Games. And all of a sudden, people were really, really interested. I think I've done those rings upside down. People were really interested in the Olympic Games. And the Brazilian government thought, excellent, loads of people are going to come to our country and spend their money. But then they looked up at the hills on Rio and they saw, gosh, look at all these ugly favelas. They're well run down, they are. All these people paying all that money to fly, to stay in the city, and they're gonna look up and see these ugly favelas. So because they won the Olympic Games and the, uh, world, the bid for the World Cup, uh, sorry, they didn't win the Olympic Games, did they? I mean, win the bid for the Olympic Games. Um, the government put this project in place to improve the conditions, so they looked, essentially, a little bit prettier and that people, people's lives were a little bit nicer who lived there. And look at what they did. We've got a photo here on the left-hand side of what it used to look like, one area. And look what they've done now. Look how pretty that looks. They've got greenery areas, so it's safer. Look at all that litter there. But here, it's clean. Children can play out there and be safe. There's photosynthesis created here, so it's gonna be a cleaner environment. And they've simply made it look nicer. It's a streets tidied up and made more appealing to live in. Look at this one here. This used, must have used to be some sort of litter, um, litter dump or garbage uh, waste disposal area, which people just chucked all over, but they've, they've changed that now. They've got a skate park, which has got young people, maybe instead of going into crime, into things like skating, sport, run down areas, turn into communities that bond. Look at this one here, I think this is a great photo. You can actually see how in the side of the mountain they've cut out, um, they've dug out, sorry, a like an astroturf sort of thing where people can play football. So again, this is getting people off the street out of crime and into sport and directing their energy elsewhere. And we've got water supply. Yes, it's uncovered, but actually sanitation supplies can now be pumped away. So instead of waste being in the street, and I'm talking about human waste, it can go and be washed away now. That's fantastic. So there's going to be less disease spread. And you'll notice maybe on some photos that there's this cable car. They've got cable cars that go all the way into the favelas and then back out into the main parts of the, uh, the economised city. And that gives people the opportunity to go and access these higher paid jobs while perhaps living in one of these favelas. So, a classic question might be, um, justify or explain the effectiveness or assess the effectiveness of an urban planning scheme. Now, before I go through the successes and failures, Imagine you open up your assessment and this nine mark question 
it, it's a double page spread. Let's just, let's imagine that this is it. I obviously haven't seen the exam, so I can't tell you. But normally with a nine marker, let's say it's question 1.10, you'll have loads of lines here, won't you, to answer. And the question might say this, justify or explain the effectiveness of an urban planning scheme. And it will also say, using your own knowledge, and it might even say, and a figure. Now on this side of the page, it may say, I don't know, let's say figure four, and you might have a photograph with some text, and another photograph with some more text, and another photograph. And this might show you some sort of urban planning scheme. This is a learning point, ladies and gents. That urban planning scheme, we didn't have to necessarily teach you about the Favela Barrier Project. There's lots of these all over the world. Perhaps there's one in India, and it might be something to do with slums in India. The figure may talk about India, but the question will be worded as so, and you'll be able to use your own knowledge. Please, please, please do refer to this figure. Pull things out you can see. But also, if it does do this, in your writing, think about what you've learnt and quote facts from the Favela Barrio project. It makes your life so much easier to get six, seven, eight or nine marks if you quote your example. It might say using your own knowledge or using your own example. And you can't just do that on this question, you can do it on any sort of question where it says using your own knowledge. So, sorry, let's clear that. Was it a success or was it a failure? First thing, of course it was a success, it was brilliant. What they did is they provided um, health and standards of living have improved. Favelas have been targeted. They have provided, and this links back to what we learned before, they've provided homes with health kits, meaning that if people get ill, they don't necessarily have to go to hospital, they can take care of themselves in their home. However, a bad thing is that residents don't necessarily have the skills to manage repairs in their properties. So what the government did is they went in to improve the conditions in there, they even built them, some of them out of brick. However, they haven't trained the residents to fix anything if it breaks, so some of it's going into disrepair. Look at this, substantial increase in school attendance. Awesome, that's brilliant. There's more people this age going to school, super duper. However, they didn't actually teach the teachers properly. So some of the teachers don't have the correct qualifications. So you've got people in school not learning very much. Property values increased. Because the government have now legalised these favelas and actually recognised them as homes, they have gone up, look at that, 80 to 120%. If you own that property, your, your quid's in, you're doing really well, you can sell it on now for more money. But, it says there, when rents and house prices rise, poorer people are priced out. Poorer people can't afford them. You can't move into one. And they used to be free, but they used to be illegal. So is, this, is it a success or is it a failure? You don't necessarily have to make a decision. You could say, I agree, because it's a success. Maybe talk about this and expand on it. But then say, however, and then you're going to tell them about the school, uh, teachers not having good qualifications. That covers the entirety of London. No, sorry, of Rio. I'm now going to move on to London because you also need to know an example of a UK city. Sorry, no, you need to know an example of a city in a HIC, a high-income country, experiencing urban change and we taught you about London. First of all though, let's look at the UK as a whole. Distribution question again, previously I did mega cities, this time I'm doing population of the UK. Look at the key, 
population distribution, just to go over that very, very quickly with you. If we went outside and jumped up high in the air and took a photo looking down, and our photo covered an area one kilometer by one kilometer, we could see the amount of people that live there. Each dot on here represents a person. If there's lots of dots in this area, there's lots of people, we would say this place is densely populated. If we took the exact same area and there were fewer people, we would say this is sparsely populated. So now let's, uh, uh, let's apply that to this map. First thing, compass directions. To make your lives easy with compass directions, look what I'm going to do with this map. You can do this on your paper tomorrow if you need to. Draw a full compass the entire way over your page and whack on those annotations. North, south, east, oh, west. Add them in. Northeast, southeast, northwest. All of a sudden, your life has just become so much easier when you're describing a distribution and using compass directions. So, describe it. This area here happens to be in the northwest. The northwest is sparsely populated compared to the southeast, which is densely populated. How does he know that? I've looked at the key. Over 150 people in this area per kilometre squared. Whereas here, the yellow bit is only 0 to 10. So the yellow bit is a bit like this. And the blue bit is a bit like this. There's more people in an area. Why? Why is there hardly anybody here but loads of people here? First of all, let's start with the northwest of Scotland. Here we know it is flat. And because it's flat, that means it is expensive to build on. And difficult. Why is it densely populated down here in the southeast? Please do not say because the capital city is there. Please say because the land is flat, which made it easier and cheaper to build on. But also, down here in the southeast, we have a big main river called the River Thames. And a long time ago, I'll say a long time ago, during the 1800s, during that Industrial Revolution, rivers equaled trade. So factories, like we said before, factories were built along rivers to then the boats could then transport and go out to other parts of the world. And if you look around the map, we've got a blue area here. London happens to be a river there. Manchester happens to be a river there. Leeds happens to be a river there. Bristol and Cardiff happen to be rivers around there. All these places, which are blue, happen to either be on the coast or around a river where trade was easy. That question is just what I've been over, suggest why the population is unevenly distributed. Highlands, mountains, here, flatland, river. London's changing. London's changing both positively and negatively. If it's changing positively, we've got lots of opportunities that are created. If it's changing negatively, we have a few challenges. In your exam, we expect them to be using this key terminology. You know how in the physical, uh, physical exam, paper one, they used the word landform? They didn't actually use the word waterfall. They didn't actually use the word cave arch stack stump. They said landforms. In your human paper, they're probably going to use the word opportunities or challenges. You need to be able to identify what they are. And the first one is gentrification. That is one opportunity that is being created in London. The next one, regeneration, improving an area that's experienced a period of decline. Urban transport scheme, we taught you about Crossrail. And finally, 
urban greening. I'm going to go through each of these individually now. First one, Shoreditch, gentrification. Now, sorry, let me just take one step back. With this, they could ask a series of questions. They might just simply say, what is regeneration? And ask for a definition like they did, what is extreme weather? They might say, what is regeneration? It's improving an area that's experienced a period of decline. They might ask where regeneration has happened or what is your example of something? Um, or it could be a much longer answer question, suggest the benefits of urban greening, suggest them, um, assess whether an urban transport scheme you have studied is effective. But not to worry, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go through each one now for you. So this is Shoreditch. Shoreditch is your example of an area that has experienced gentrification. Gentrification is an improving an area to appeal to the middle class or the rich or the wealthier person. Now, look at it. It's gone from this post-World War II to this more modern day. Look at the change. It's the exact same building and this one on the right is looking certainly more prettier. Oh. So you need to know what's good and what's bad about it. We have taught you to look at different groups of people and how it affects them. If we take a young professional, for example, somebody who is qualified, has been to university and is looking for a job, what they have done in Shoreditch is they have increased rent prices. That's fine for a young professional because they can afford those houses. They've increased the number of jobs in the high tech industry. I'm talking about jobs like HP, Acer, Apple, all those sort of jobs. Jobs that you need a degree for. So all these young professionals, brilliant, they can get a job there. They've also increased the number of pubs and clubs for them to socialize in an evening. So young professionals, gentrification, great for them. They're doing really, really well. On the other hand, maybe a low income family, perhaps a low income Bangladeshi family that lived there a long, well, that have lived there a long time. Look at this, rent prices have increased. Low income family. If rent prices are increasing, increased rent, they're gonna miss out because they can't afford that rent. If the number of jobs going up, jobs which you need a degree for, well, they're low income because they don't have a degree, so they're also going to miss out. And finally, if there's pubs and clubs, imagine it at night time, it's gonna be pretty loud, they're not going to enjoy that. So low income Bangladeshi families will be pushed out, young professionals will be pulled in. Regeneration. Regeneration, I'm just gonna get rid of this photo for a second and I'll show you why in a minute. Regeneration, oh, I'll just do the definition. Improving an area which has experienced a period of decline. Now I'm going to show you um, I'm not going to use the photo for this one. I'd like to demonstrate using a, um, a bit of a drawing. The River Thames is in London. This blue wiggly line represents the River Thames. This represents a smaller river, which I'll come to shortly. On the River Thames, in the 1800s, was the London Docklands here. This area was... Uh, the river's obviously natural, but this area here was artificially built, built by humans. And what that was for is for boats could come up the River Thames from other parts of the world and unload their cargo. And there was factories here and different warehouses where people worked and that cargo got unloaded. This was brilliant. This was fantastic. There was things like tea, 
coffee, tin, sugar, all coming in from the West Indies towards the Caribbean way. This was all being shipped in. And then all that tea, coffee and sugar was being sorted out here in the factories, which employed loads of people. So people here might have worked as cargo workers. They may have worked as shipmen or shipwomen, or they may have worked simply in a factory, I don't know, bagging, be specific, bagging coffee. So all these people were really, really employed. Superb. All of a sudden, though, this thing happened called containerization. And the boats went from being this big to being this big. And when the boats became much bigger, they could, con they could hold all of these containers, which I'm sure you've seen going on the motorway. But these big boats couldn't sail up the River Thames. They were too big. All of a sudden, poor people, these guys all lost their jobs. Because the boats became too big, this area pretty much just became derelict. That means crime increased. Unemployment increased. How horrible. Unemployment increased. Places became derelict and run down. Derelict places increased. You know, you know what I'm saying. And this place became pretty much abandoned. Jump forward to the 1980s. Jump forward to the 1980s. Jumping forward here. I need, it's, it's, my ball's getting a bit messy here. Jump forward to the 1980s. And the government um, came up with a company called the LDDC, the London, Dockland, the London Development Dockland Corporation. And it was their job to build Canary Wharf. And what they did is they saw this opportunity to build very, very high sky um, flats and everything. Not flats, sorry. Offices like HSBC to attract investment. And all these banks now, you've got one of HSBC's biggest offices here that has employed now young professionals that's bringing money back into the area. They've cleaned up this water area, the Docklands, and it's a really attractive place to go and walk around now. So that's brought back employment, brought back money into the uh, economy through tax, which has improved education and healthcare. The number of professionals has gone up, so jobs in real estate, jobs in uh, universities has gone up. but what was still left was an area what color am i going to go for here this area still around this area around the docklands here was still pretty run down so during when when these boats used to come in a long time ago all the people that worked in the docklands lived here this area of london was called Newham, well, is called Newham. And because all of these people lost their jobs, Newham became quite run down. All of these people left their homes, they couldn't afford the mortgages or rent, so it became really run down, terraced housing. Now, when they built Canary Wharf, this bit was still pretty undeveloped. Jump forward, here we go again, to 2012. Everyone, if you're unsure of why that date's significant, we held the Olympic Games, the London Olympics. This river here is called the Lower Lee Tributary. It's just a small river which joins the River Thames. This area here was also pretty derelict, the Lower Lee Valley area. It was also quite flat. In 2012, when we won the Olympic Games, the government thought, brilliant, let's build stadiums here. Let's build a velodrome. Let's build an aquatic centre. Let's attract loads of money into this area. And let's regenerate Newham. Excellent. This brought in jobs specifically to a shopping centre which employed 10,000 people. So economically, big bonus. The stadium 
is now West Ham Stadium. So it's still being used, West Ham Football Stadium. So it's generating money for the economy. The Aquatic Center, public members, public members are allowed to go use that. Schools go use it. So it's improving life expectancy of the entire area. If you've got any qu further questions on that, please put them on the comments and uh, Miss Morrissey will shoot them, shoot them your way. Another opportunity, Crossrail. Crossrail, if this is London, it happens to go across London. When Crossrail, uh, when Crossrail is being developed, there are seven new stations along the course of this new, what is essentially a tube line. And they are doing this to increase the number of passengers and people going into London. But what's more is if this is central London here and they have built this new line called Crossrail and they've built these uh, seven new stations. If you live near one of these new stations and you have a house, the benefit is the price of your house is going to go up. That's fantastic. However, if you are a new homeowner looking to move in, you're not going to be able to afford that because the price has just gone up. Sad face, we don't like that. So the fact that house prices are going up near the stations is actually negative as well as positive. Fun facts for you to throw in. Each train is going to have, I think, about 24 carriages. Each train will be able to hold 1,500 people. You throw these facts in, you're going to look really, really good. The trains are going to be Wi-Fi enabled. Some of, some of it's all, already opened. Um, and I think that's just about as much as you'll need to know on the integrated transport system. And finally, urban greening. Urban greening is planting trees and parks in urban areas. Remember, urban, urban meaning city and town. So if we increase the amount of green areas, there's going to be all different benefits. First of all, socially. If we do it socially, it's going to de-stress people. Imagine that. Imagine if you go to the park during work. You can go de-stress. You can socialise. Meaning, productivity in work is going to increase. That's going to be really, really good for the economy. Urban greening is also good for the environment, isn't it? Because if we have more afforestation, that's the planting of trees, it is going to absorb flood water, but more importantly then, that will reduce the economic impact of flooding. Urban challenges. We've just done opportunities. Challenges are the bad things. Look at this. This is Newham here. I think, am I going to label it? Oh, I'll come back to it later. Uh, this is Newham and Kensington and Chelsea. So inequalities in housing, education, health and employment. Bad, bad, bad. Urban sprawl. As more people move in, these houses are starting to expand out. Where's everyone going to live? And finally, pollution. London has a significant pollution problem. To go through these then, the first challenge is inequality. Look at the characteristics of these two. These are boarded up houses, boarded up. There is little greenery. Remember, greenery makes us feel at ease. There are no street lights. Not very safe at night time compared to this one. Look at this, gated communities. Expensive cars. And finally, look at that, street lighting, meaning it's much safer to walk around at night time. Now, when we're comparing Newham and Kensington and Chelsea, that's one place, by the way, look at the difference. Kensington and Chelsea, which is rich, and this is poor or less rich. Look at that. People live on average till they're 85 in Kensington and Chelsea, whereas in Newham, 78. And look at the unemployment. Look at the amount of people. 9.4% of people are unemployed in Newham. Only 3.9 in Kensington and Chelsea. Now, watch the link. If only 60% of people are leaving with five or more GCSEs, of course the unemployment rate is going to be higher. 
because they don't have the qualifications to get a job. And therefore, they can't take care of themselves or perhaps don't have the education to and are more unhealthy, which is why the life expectancy is lower. If you want to take a little a look at that a little bit more, please do pause it and do so. Urban sprawl. Similar to Rio, look what's happening to London's population. It is increasing. More young people are moving there. So where on earth are we going to house them all? Urban sprawl is now moving onto that green belt, which goes around a green belt, an area of Greenland and fields around a city. Are we going to house people on the green area, on a greenfield site, or on a brownfield site, which is previously being developed on? Benefits then. If we go on a brown, oh, this, this, this is the wrong way around this, because the brownfield's there and the greenfield's there. If we build on a brownfield site, well, it's going to cause less damage to habitats. Fantastic. But look, it's also flat. So it's flat already, so it's cheaper to build on. However, it could be more expensive to build on because the land price in a city is going to be much more expensive to build on. Sorry, I'll try to improve my handwriting. I know I'm getting a bit sloppy with it. Um, also, if you live here, you can walk to work. However, the bad things, so the negatives, the negatives of this are going to be that your flat will be small, flat, small, and there is going to be more crime. So what should we do then? Should we build on greenfield sites instead? Because on greenfield sites, you can have larger homes, you can have gardens where your children can play out and be safe, you can have a driveway so you can own a car. Um, the quality of air is much nicer. And finally, there is less crime. However, the negatives is it's going to have a significant impact on habitats. Um, it could also be very expensive to build on if farmers already own that land. They might be charging a lot to give it up. Have I missed any? Land is cheaper in rural areas. Oh, well, ignore that one because the way I've just explained it, I don't want you to say that. Uh, no, no demolition or decontamination need of land. You can pretty much build on that straight away as long as it's flat. More space to build larger luxury homes. This one, reducing the need for urban sprawl. Public transport is better in urban areas, so you don't need a car. And uh, new developments can improve, yeah. So, London's pollution problem. We know, here's my attempt at drawing a car. We know if there are going to be more cars, there is certainly going to be more pollution all in the atmosphere. That is going to cause significant breathing difficulties such as asthma and bronchitis that then will put pressure on the NHS and taxpayers that's bad so solving it what are they doing they are well they've built crossrail but more importantly they have developed these super cycle highways and what that is is if we imagine if we imagine that um, this circle here represents London, and London is our entire city, and this is specifically central London. So this is central. This is L the, the, this just the, the outer skirts of the city. Um, what they've done is they've um, developed about six or seven super cycle highway um, lines, a little bit like this, that people can cycle into central London on therefore reducing the need for cars, less traffic, less congestion, less pollution, less breathing difficulties. And also because people are cycling, they will be physically healthier, which makes, um, reduces pressure on the NHS. I'm not sure if that's a bike with a person on or a dog. 
Sustainable living, something else which we're quite, well, not necessarily confident, but we wouldn't be surprised if, if, if it comes up. This is the East, have I got it? Oh, the East Village. This was a, an, a bunch of apartments that were built as part of the Olympic Games. When the athletes stayed in London, um, they built these apartments for the, London, for the athletes to stay in. What was really, really good about that is they were a sustainable set of apartments and I'm now going to go through the different features with you. First of all, you can see one nice and clear, they had trees to increase photosynthesis and increase uh, the rate of CO2 being changed for oxygen. They also had nice and simple double glazing windows. Ladies and gents, please, it's, it's, it's going to say here, opportunity, demonstrate our understanding. Double glazing windows, that is going to reduce your heating bills. It's also going to reduce the need to heat your home. So you're going to use less energy. And one which is really interesting to remember is at the bottom here, for every single apartment, they built a, um, a bicycle... Um, a bicycle storage facility, so every apartment could store a bike. That meant that people are encouraged to use their bike to go to the shops as opposed to using their car. More sustainable, producing less CO2. Happy days, people are also healthy, reducing pressure on the NHS. Um, I did skip through that a bit quickly then. Just a side note. After this was used by the Olympic athletes, after the two weeks of the Olympic Games and two weeks of the Paralympic Games, um, they put these on sale to the general public at a reasonable price as well. Um, so it was affordable housing, also sustainable. Section B, I'm going to just have a quick drink and I'll be back with you in no more than about one minute. Excuse me, I hope you can't hear um, me gulping that water. Um, right, section B. So this is uh, the second section. We've done section A. Section B, gosh, that's taken now. I'll, tr I'll try to be a, be, yeah, I'll try to be a little more snappy um, with this. Um, so section B, yeah, changing economic world. You're going to answer all the questions in this, ladies and gents. We taught you about Nigeria and the UK economy. We didn't have to. We could have taught you about anything that we wanted. We specifically chose, though, Nigeria and the UK economy as our examples. First of all, development. How can we measure development? How do we know somewhere is very developed compared to not very developed? First of all, we can look at literacy. Is it going to pop up now? Literacy rate. That is the percent of people that can read and write. In our country, it's 99% because we're really, really clever and we've got good education. However, in some countries, it can be low as about 50%. Only 50% of people read and write. This is the number of doctors, so the number of doctors to people. And finally, this is representing GNI, the income of a country. Obviously, if a country's got loads of money, you can tell it's doing well. If it's a poor country, it's not. However, GNI, which is the income of a country, we know that HDI, the Human Development Index, excuse me, I've just hiccuped there, this combines life expectancy, it combines GNI, and it combines uh, literacy rate. And they bob all these numbers together and it produces a figure between zero and one. I think for the UK, our HDI figure is something like 0 0.89, whereas in some countries it is as low as 0 0.32. The closer you are to one, the more developed you are. Why is HDI better than GNI to measure development? Well, it is comparing, it combines three indicators as opposed to just one. Imagine if you look at income. 
If you look, just look at China, and let's just say off the top of our heads, China is earning something like, uh, China has something, I don't know, like two trillion dollars compared to the UK, where the UK has maybe, I don't know, this is literally off the top of my head, 1.5 trillion. You might think China's a richer country. Well, actually, no, it's not, because China has so many more people than us. The UK is a much richer country. It doesn't consider variations within the country. You might have some rich people, some poor people, and it doesn't consider the size. Demographic transition model, something you need to be really, really familiar with. It wouldn't surprise me if this came up at all. Five different stages. It shows us three things. Death rate, birth rate, total population. Stage one, we could say that this is an undeveloped place. Stage five, we would say this is a developed place or country. Look what happens. Just have a quick scan through it. The death rate in stage one is high, then it falls down to be really low. The birth rate, there's loads of births in these countries, then all of a sudden it decreases and is low. Meanwhile, the population is increasing. So, what is it showing and why is this happening? Why is the birth rate and death rate so high? Well, if the death rate's so high, this must mean poor health care. People can't take care of themselves. They don't have the medic uh, med medical facilities to take care of themselves. Also, because the birth rate's so high, there might be no contraception. Or children are needed for farming. Because your example here is a country called Kenya. A country? Yeah, a country called Kenya where it's not very developed and they still farm predominantly. More children they have, more farming the family can do. But look what's happened here. Health care. Health care is improving, which is why the death rate is decreasing. We get to a country called Brazil. Now, Brazil, it isn't necessarily poor, nor is it super rich. It's an NEE. It is developing. Its birth rate is starting to fall because now they have dis discovered contraception and women have rights and are now working, which is why the birth rates are falling. Women aren't just expected to stay at home. Finally, the birth rate is really, really low. But look what happens. This is, this is us, by the way, sorry. Uh, the UK, we're an example of stage four. We will probably be about here. We're just about to go into stage five. Look what's happened to the total population. It's starting to decrease. But let's just review what's happened here, and I'll tell you why it's decreasing. Healthcare improves, healthcare improves, healthcare's really good, healthcare's, oh, healthcare's amazing, healthcare's brilliant. This, the countries here, like Japan and Germany, have had health, good healthcare for now so long that everyone is really old. Well, I'll say everyone, a lot of people are old, so they have now an aging population. I'm talking a lot of people who are 60, year old, who are 60 or more years old. Generally, people who are 60 and over don't have children. And if you've got lots of them, these people who are living longer, they're not having children, which is why the birth rate is decreasing. And actually, now more people are dying than they are. Aging population, problems. If there's a lot of people, we don't have the workforce to take care of them. Um, so the economy is going to suffer. Um, pause it if you want to look there and have a quick read through. Reasons for changes there. Uh, a few examples. Uh, but I've gone through the main things that you need to be aware of. What does birth rate mean? Birth rate is the number of people, uh, number of people born per thousand that exist in the country. There you go. Oh, it's on the board there. Uh, natural increase. We can see the natural increase is birth rate take away death rate. Natural increase there is decreasing. Why might a birth rate start to fall in stage three to four? We've just been through this. Um, population pyramids. I picked out Nigeria here. Just to go through with what a population pyramid shows, we can see male there, we can see the word female there. We can see this says Nigeria 2016. Look at the base, it says age group. We've got population in millions, population in millions. Let me show you what it shows. This bar graph here, 
This from zero to four years old to the left hand side all the way here goes to about there, 12, 13, 14, 15, to about 15, what's that? That's 15 million. That means that in Nigeria in 2016, there were 15 million boys aged zero to four. But what about that? In 2016, there were 4 million boys or males aged 40 to 44. That's what it shows. So we can quite clearly see here in 2016, there were a lot more young people in Nigeria than there were old people. Look at that. Look at the amount of 90, 94 year olds between both males and females. Hardly any, not even 1 million. So if a population pyramid has a wide base, Look at that, it's got a really, really wide base. That must mean they have a high birth rate. They've got loads of kids being born here. What does, um, which pyramid it says represents as a HIC? Now, which countries have loads of kids? Poor countries. Poor countries have loads of kids because they've got poor health care. This is a rich country. Notice how the base is fairly wide, but it stays fairly wide until about 60 years old. Meaning, if you're born, you're pretty much guaranteed to live in a rich country until you're at least 60. Then it starts curving off. Three causes of uneven development. If you look at a world map, look at a world map here. Why are some places, like the one I'm circling there, why are these places poor? But these places really, really rich. What has caused uneven development? First one, the economy. Second one, the physical landscape. And the third one, history. If we specifically uh, focus on the physical landscape, Europe has a long coastline. Lots of Europe is on a coastline, meaning that it's easy to trade with it by boat. But look at this country here, the Democratic Republic of Congo. It is what we call landlocked, surrounded by land. You can't get a boat there, so why on earth are you going to want to trade with it? It's well expensive to fly there and trade by, uh, uh, by plane. It's easier and cheaper to trade by boat, which is why landlocked countries are a little bit poorer and can't necessarily afford to trade. And historical, we all know that Europeans during colonial times went over to Af uh, parts of Africa. They took things like tin, copper, silver, gold. They took all their valuable resources, jumped forward now. What's that say called? Gold. Um, they jumped forward now and they, can't, they don't have anything to trade with. So that is what's caused places to be rich and places to be poor. And as a result, the consequence then, because some places are rich and some places are poor, you're going to get lots of disease, like things like Ebola. You're going to get lots of disease in poor places because the poor places can't afford the medicine to take care of it. I've read studies which have said that if Ebola broke out in the UK, which never would have happened because we have the medicine to prevent that from ever occurring, if Ebola broke out in the UK, we could take care of it because we have sterilised hospitals. In western parts of Africa, when this happened, they couldn't afford hospitals to take care of the people, which is why there were so many deaths. That is a consequence of uneven development. Migration. Think about Syria at the minute. Syria isn't a very rich country at all. People want out because there's war, because there's conflict, because it's poor. Remittances. This is a really, really good thing, this one. Because people have migrated to other countries, what they do is they send money back home to their original country, helping that country develop. Aid. The brain drain. We have uh, lots of people from different parts of Europe coming across to places like Germany, France, uh, the UK, where the jobs are higher paid. And they're doing that because they have qualifications in these countries. So they move to other countries which are richer, like the UK, where we have higher paid jobs, which they're qualified to do. 
That's bad though for the, uh, for the home country because they are losing the qualified people. So they're never going to develop. That is called the brain drain. So if we've got these poor countries and these rich countries, how can we bridge this gap? How can we make the poorer countries richer? And some of you might be saying, well, sir, it's never going to happen. Yeah, it probably is never going to be fully equal, but how can we reduce the gap? First thing, debt relief. Simply say to countries, you don't owe us money anymore. Just wipe that money off so all of their income can go um, into developing their infrastructure and healthcare. Using technology, look at this. Just something simple as a water pump can provide a country with clean water, therefore there's not going to be less disease. Investment, putting money into countries. There's lots of Chinese money going into, uh, China's money going into Africa at the minute, uh, parts of Africa, to build things like train lines to increase um, the, the opportunity to trade. Aid, literally giving them money or giving them resources. Uh, fair trade, giving farmers a fair price for their coffee and bananas. Tourism, and finally, microfinance loans. I'm going to focus on tourism quickly. We taught you about Jamaica. Jamaica is using tourism to try become richer, to develop. Why is that good? Well, there is employment now, employment in hotels or employment as tour guides and because these people are being paid by the tourists like you and me going over that means that tax will increase that means education will increase that means healthcare, health will increase improving all the things in that country infrastructure will improve they'll have better roads meaning that they can trade better. However, it's only really going to benefit coastal areas because who would ever go to Jamaica and say, oh, I'm going to go stay in the central of Jamaica, uh, central Jamaica. You want to stay near the coast where there's lots of sand and nice beaches. So sometimes the um, inland parts of these areas can't benefit as much. And think of this, loads of people going, there's going to be litter on beaches. Maybe coral reefs might be destroyed by people who are going snorkeling or scuba diving. Not very good at all. Um, tourists spending money, future the economy, brilliant. Creating jobs, working in hotels, development of infrastructure, and finally funding to protect the environment as well. So some of that money can actually protect the environment too. Your example of an NEE in Africa, we have taught you about Nigeria, particularly the city of Lagos, which is on the south coast, touching um, the Atlantic Ocean. TNCs. The TNC is a transnational corporation. It is simply a company that operates in two or more countries. Nike, KPMG, BP, HSBC. We taught you about Shell. And you need to know what the good things about TNCs are and the bad things. So imagine Shell this, originally a Dutch company, but now is owned by an American company. The benefits, it's going to contribute loads in taxes. If they are drilling for oil in Nigeria, they're going to be paying taxes. Education, healthcare, improves life expectancy, increases qualifications, multiplier effect. It provides direct employment. Look at that, great fact. 65,000 workers will be employed and 91% of Shell contracts go to Nigerian companies. Superb. So when Shell come in there and start drilling, they get Nigerian companies to drill for the oil. So Nigeria is getting the money. However, the bad things, specifically oil, oil spills have caused water pollution, degradation. Agri reducing agriculture, so that reduces agriculture, meaning that farming might decrease. That's not very good at all for farmers. And there's frequent oil flares, so that's going to cause pollution. That's terrible. And there's one which I've not got on here, which is management jobs. So the managers go to foreigners so it might go to americans or europeans 
which isn't necessarily good because these are the highest paid jobs, but Shell want their people doing them. So good things and bad things about them there. What is aid? Aid is also another way that we can bridge that gap between the poor and the rich, bridging that gap there. There's two types of aid. Aid is always, it's helping a country out somehow by money, food, technology. There's two types. Official development assistance aid. That is simply given by governments. Every single year, the UK government will always donate some sort of money to helping other countries develop. Then there's voluntary aid. This was the one you've always heard of. There's been an earthquake in such and such. Can you please donate X amount of money? This is through the things like either money sometimes, but more importantly, like through money that pays for water, uh, maybe tents. Good thing, uh, something to make note of um, official development assistance. So this first type, it can be multilateral. So from organizations like uh, the World Bank, or it can be bilateral. It could be simply from another country. We do. We give it. We give money to some countries. The bad thing is, though, is this can sometimes come with strings attached. Meaning, let's say, for example, the UK gave Nigeria, hypothetically, one hundred pounds to spend on whatever they want. There's a there's a string attached, which that hundred pounds would need to be spent in the UK. They'd have to buy it from us. Sorry. Voluntary aid, two types, can be short, can be long. Short-term aid, we can see on the photo here. Long-term aid, supporting buildings in the future if there's been an earthquake. Economic growth in NEEs, the environmental issues. There's lots of economic growth now in Nigeria. Have a look at this. It's creating then urban growth. If all this investment's happening, people are moving in. That means there's going to be limited space for housing, which is why they've started building these water houses in Nigeria. But if there's more people, that means then they can build more factories because they've got the workforce to do so. That is going to increase pollution and uh, contribute to the green, um, greenhouse effect. But also if there's more people, there's going to be more deforestation, chopping down spaces, deforestation, chopping down areas to make room for factories and more homes. Can be good though. Economic growth is a superb thing. Look at this photograph here. We can see an entire family, which looks a bit funny, on a motorbike, but check it out. Look at the road. The road is smooth. If the road is smooth, that suggests good infrastructure. This family in particular has a motorbike which looks pretty clean. If it's clean, it might be new, but they have been able to afford that because they have the money. This gent here, well, sorry, no, all of them are looking fairly clean. So perhaps they have access to water and a shower. This young lad here, he's in a school uniform, so they can afford, a, uh, they can afford to send him to school. What else have we got? Reliable, better paid jobs, high disposable income to spend on schooling, home improvements, food and clothes, infrastructure improvements through economic growth because there's more money, access to safe water so there's going to be limited cholera spreading, reliable, elect reliable electricity and finally better health care as well. Develop those answers, don't you? They can go to school. They can go to school to get better jobs. Therefore, they can get qualifications. In better infrastructure such as smooth roads allows trans easy transport of goods. Just fully explain your answer. UK economy. Told you about Nigeria. Now we're on the UK economy. And look what has happened. Here's a key. Primary sector. Years 1800. 70% of people in the year 1800 were employed in the primary sector. Things like farming and mining. Look what happens, it begins to decrease. Now, today, about 10% of people are employed in either mining and farming. Look what's happened to the tertiary sector. This includes teachers, bus drivers, policemen, people who work in supermarkets, anything which isn't either collecting raw materials or creating something, making something um, which is the secondary. And what's happened, it used to be 10% and now 
it is about 65% of people in this country, so, sorry, 55, that isn't it, <gasps> excuse me, 55% of people are employed in the tertiary sector. Why has that happened? Why have we gone from 75% primary to nearly 74% tertiary? First reason, deindustrialization. Factories now have closed down. Why? Because of this, globalization. Everything is made in China. It's made in China because China have a large workforce, meaning they can make things cheaply. We can't do that. Therefore, they now make things in China. How is that possible? Globalization through trade, the internet, and communication. We can talk to China right now on the phone and tell them what we want that's possible. And finally, governmental policies. Governmental policies such as Thatcher in the 1980s closed the coal mines, Clo oh, closed the mines. People got very, very angry about that, but they closed the mines because it was cheaper to get the coal elsewhere. Therefore, the number of people in the prime industry massively declined. Impacts of industry on the environment. It doesn't look very nice. If we're constantly build, um, developing new things, it's not going to look very nice. Air and water pollution, waste products. I've got a photo coming up here. There we go. Here's a river. That industry, which used to be in the UK, has polluted our rivers massively. Imagine there must have been a factory here and then maybe a pipe with stuff leaking into it. Now this then is going to um, affect aquatic ecosystems. It might even cause eutrophication, which I'll come to shortly in resource management. So what we have had to teach you is a sustainable industry in the UK. And we taught you about Nissan. This car, the Nissan Leaf, first of all, is made of lightweight material. The fact it's made of lightweight material means it needs less energy or fuel therefore it is cheaper to fill this car up and because it is lighter it travels further on one tank of petrol some of it is powered by electricity so it doesn't produce as greenhouse gas gases it is re made of recyclable materials and the factory where it was made, so the factory itself has windows in the roof so it is naturally lit, therefore they don't need to use electricity to see um, inside except when it gets dark. The UK's post-industrial economy. It used to be this, we used to make lots of things during the Industrial Revolution. Now, we're predominantly working on computers. The, uh, sorry, everything's driven by computers, sorry. The post-industrial economy where the manufacturing industry has been replaced by the tertiary industry. That is the service sector. And this is an example of that. This is Cambridge. Cambridge has become a high-tech hub where companies such as HP, Acer, Apple have located in the post-industrial economy and it's super because it's really close to London, just along the M4, uh, not M4, uh, M40, some, along the motorway, I can't remember what motorway it is. Um, easy access from London, so young professionals can either live in London and work there or just access it easy from the capital where all that knowledge is. So, why on earth might be now, we're moving on now slightly, why might be people moving out of cities in HICs? Why are people counter-urbanising? We know because transport, because they can, it's possible to do that. It is overcrowded in some cities. Houses can be bigger and cheaper. There is litter and crime in cities. And finally, 
areas have become derelict. Moving on, follow me on this one. This red line represents an area called Cambridgeshire, a bit like Yorkshire. But that area, look how it changes there. That area is called South Cambridgeshire, a little bit like North Yorkshire. This is South Cambridgeshire zoomed in and you can see this is the city of Cambridge within South Cambridgeshire. Like York is in North Yorkshire, Cambridge is in South Cambridgeshire. It is a city within a county. Loads of people have moved to Cambridge City because of the post-industrial economy and the jobs. People are moving in there. As more people move in, house prices increase. So, instead of living and working in the city, people just work in the city and they are moving out to the suburb, not suburbs, the rural parts. People now move into the rural parts where houses are cheaper. This is an area experiencing, sorry, this is a rural area experiencing population growth. The rural area here, bearing in mind this is the city of Cambridge, the rural area around it is experiencing population growth. Um, this really could come up as a one, two, four, six or nine marker, something along this. This area is experiencing population growth, okay? Now that's really, really good because more people might decide to use buses, which is going to improve the economy of South Cambridgeshire. People can have larger houses, but prices of petrol might, sorry, prices of petrol might increase because there might be more car users. The opposite's happening here. The question says, the UK's econo economic activity is skewed towards the southeast. This area here, look at all the economic activity going on. We already know that this part of the land is flat and it had the river, which is why people located there. And we know then that this area has lots of mountains, which made it really, really difficult to build on. It's called, this area is called the Outer Hebrides. What might people do if they are born in this area? Look, there's hardly any economic activity. They're gonna move towards the southeast where there's much more going on. Look how hard it is to get there as well. If you want to go from London, there isn't necessarily a direct flight. You're gonna have to go to Edinburgh and then a smaller flight, or you're gonna have to go to uh, London, to Inverness, drive to the coast, get a ferry, or you might, be, you might be able to get a small flight, but it's, you know, they're not gonna be regular. It's really, really quite remote and disconnected. It's not easy to get to. So the problems that you're gonna get then, oh, out of, if this area is suffering population decline, it's going to have an aging population. There's not going to be enough young people to be earning the money to take care of them, all them there at all. South Cambridgeshire though, go back to the previous slide, you'll see what the good things and the bad things of population growth are. How can we reduce this divide? If we just go back to this photograph here, how can we reduce the divide between the north part of the UK and the south? Because there's clearly lots of economic activity here, not a lot here. A few things that we can do. First thing, things like HS2. HS2, High Speed 2, is a, is a railway which is um, going from London to the north part of England. Um, so people can live here and work down in London, but they're going to spend the money back in the north, which is superb because it's going to spread that economic wealth across the country. Smart motorways. If we make transport much easier it's going to create the flow of traffic so people are going to be more inclined to trade and finally building things docklands so at the, in the south there is london gateway but more importantly 
in the north, we have now Liverpool 2. That is a huge dock. This is it on the right hand side. Liverpool 2 isn't a city. It's, a, it's called a dock. It, the dock is called Liverpool 2. It's a very, very big um, dock where boats can come in and unload their cargo. And they've made it nice and big so the largest ships can come in there. That'll increase economic activity in the north. Moving on to the final section now. A little, uh, a little footnote for you. Section C, there will be question three, question four, question five and question six. Every single person needs to answer question three. That will either be on food, water, energy, or a combination of the three. It won't be a very long question. There may be only one, two, or three parts, perhaps. Question four is just to do with food. You are not going to answer that. Question five is just to do with water. You are not going to answer that. You are going to answer question six, energy. Oh, yeah, sorry, you are answering that. So you are answering in this exam, question one, question two, question three, and question six. I will go over with that you, I go over that with you tomorrow. Specifically though, you do need to know a little bit about food because it could come up. Why is food demand changing in the UK? First reason, globalization. You are aware of different foods across the world. Think about avocados. Avocados don't grow in this country. Due to globalization, you're aware of them, therefore you want them, therefore the demand is going up. Population is increasing, therefore we need more food. That is why the demand is changing. And finally, seasonal demand. We expect strawberries all year round. Strawberries in this country only grow in the summer. However, you go in November to the supermarkets, I can guarantee you'll find some strawberries because there's seasonal demand all year round. So we have to source them from other countries. What are food miles? I have just talk, uh, spoken about avocados. Avocados predominantly grow here in Central America. They are then flown over to the UK of a distance of about 4,000 500 miles. That is going to produce a lot of CO2 in the plane, then they have to be transported to the supermarket, then from the supermarket to your house, and then they, well, if you, I don't know, you don't cook a, you don't cook an avocado here, but it's the amount of miles that piece of food has had to travel, which is going to have an impact on uh, the, your carbon footprint. Not very good for the economy, which is why people who like organic farming is good because it's lo locally so sourced. Carbon footprint. That is, the, uh, that is the amount of carbon produced, essentially, by the food on your plate. Imagine if you got home tonight and you had a plate of food, you had a burger, you had chips, um, you had beans, you had maybe an, an orange for dessert. Think of all the different places where that food has come from and that contribution to your, is your carbon footprint. Um, so, how is demand changing then? How is our demand for food changing? First of all, organic farming. Because people don't really like the idea of eating meat at the minute, uh, because maybe they don't like what's gone into it, organic farming is the growth of um, things like vegetables and, and animals naturally, without, so no use of pesticides or fertilizers. It is all done naturally. That is organic farming. And people are doing this for health, their own health, and because of concerns to do with the environment. Agribusiness. Because the population of the UK is increasing, the UK is developing things like this. It is essentially uh, intensive farming techniques that use computers. You can't necessarily see it here, but this is a greenhouse. And up here in the roof, what they will have is they'll have specially, um, special pipes, which every hour or so, a computer will uh, send a notification to water these plants a certain amount with a certain amount of fertilizers and pesticides to grow them as quickly as possible, but also to grow them um, as densely as possible as well to, inc to meet that growing demand for food due to our population. You need to know a little bit about water. Why is demand for water changing? Pretty much the same as the food. We, need, we have 
increased growth of food, which we need water for. Our population is increasing. Go back 200 years ago, we didn't have inten uh, high energy, um, high water intensive appliances such as washing machines. Lifestyle, people like doing things like golf and you know that the, water, the golf courses need water and, and power showers or power showers if, if you were Northern Irish. Population growth, water intensive appliances, lifestyle choices and increased demand for food is increasing water use. So how are they in man managing uh, this supply? Because if you ever look at a map, you'll notice that the UK gets most rainfall here, where I'm highlighting now. The UK gets most rainfall here and hardly any rainfall there. But here is where the population is the most. So what they are doing is they are building water transfer schemes which move water down the country. What's good about that is it meets, it actually meets water demand. Superb. However, it is bad because it is going to go through fields, destroying habitats, people's homes. There are pumping stations to keep the flow of water going, which pollute. And people think it is an eyesore meaning it looks ugly and they don't like it. What causes UK water pollution? This is where we go to eutrophication. Look at all these things that are happening. You've got factories, you've got chemical waste storage, you've got things underneath the ground which seep into the water, pesticides and fertilisers. These are all things which pollute our water sources. And look at the effects, eutrophication. As pesticides and fertilisers, sink into the water from the farms around, that intensifies the growth of algae. That covers the water. That means that plants can't grow because they can't photosynthesize. That means fish can't necessarily then eat the plants because the plants haven't grown, so they die. This process is called eutrophication. Contaminated drinking water, dead straightforward. That is gonna impact on your health and put pressure on the healthcare system. Increased water temperatures killing aquatic ecosystems. As our climate, sorry, no. If we go back to this photograph here, sometimes waste gets put into the river, which can be warm, literally warm water being put into the, um, into water, into bodies of water. If it's a delicate ecosystem, some fish and some, eat, uh, and some plants can only withstand certain temperatures. If it goes up slightly, they are going to die. Increased water temperatures. How can we manage it then? Simply educate people, tell them what to do. We can have green roofs. So when it rains, the dirty, maybe uh, the dirty acid rain can get filtered by the plants. And finally, wastewater treatment, simply making sure that we are filtering our water um, when it's coming out of that supply and that we're not drinking from water supplies from rivers. Resource management. Last bit. There's a key term here, which I always find really, really difficult to um, understand. So let's go slowly here. What does low energy insecurity mean? This is a double negative. If you are energy insecure, if you are insecure, secure, if you are insecure about your energy source, that means that, oh, you're a little bit nervous about it. You don't have a lot of it. But look, so if you have a low energy insecurity, a low energy insecurity must mean that you have loads of energy. Unfortunately, it's the terminology that they used it, so it can be a little bit confusing, but just take it slow. This could be a dead easy one mark question if you've listened to this. Low energy insecurity means that the, the country has enough energy to meet demand. Which countries then have a low in energy insecurity? Which of these countries on here are doing all right? This one, Russia, they've got loads of gas, they're doing fine. This one, Saudi Arabia, they have loads of oil. This one, Canada, 
They've also got loads of oil. You can see Australia's not doing too bad with their solar energy either. All the green countries have a low energy insecurity. On the other hand, look at us. USA, us, most parts of Europe, India, because they have so much industry now and not enough, maybe they don't have gas reserves or oil, their energy insecurity is pretty high, meaning that they depend on getting it from other places. Why is demand increasing? Exactly like food and water, population, energy intensive appliances, demand for seasonal growth, which uses electricity and gas, lifestyle, and finally this one, economic growth in Nigeria and NEEs. All these rich, uh, poorer countries and NEEs are increasing their economic activity. There's more factories, um, more things being made, more energy being used, therefore demand is increasing. What factors affect supply? Why might we be at risk at not getting it? First one, geology. Think about fracking. Fracking, if this is the land, fracking is where we dig down and drill and then release lots of gas, shale gas, which comes to the surface. But if the rock type is incorrect, the geology, geology means rock type, if the geology is incorrect, we can't drill down. So that will influence our supply. Political factors. Russia, over here, Russia have a lot of gas. Ukraine, Ukraine own all of these red pipes. Well, most of them. Here's what happened. In around 2007, Russia was paying Ukraine to say, if we give, some, if we give you some money, we are right to pump our gas through your pipes because then it goes to the UK, Germany, France. I'll say that again. Russia pay Ukraine to pump the gas through Ukraine's pipes. All of these pipes are owned by Ukraine. And we, the UK and Europe, buy our gas from Russia. All of a sudden, Ukraine said to Russia, You're gonna, you, you need to pay us more money. You need to pay us more money to put the gas through the pipes. Russia said, you're having a laugh, aren't you? And Ukraine said, no. Ukraine switched off the supply then. They put a block, they said, you cannot use our pipes. All of these guys got really annoyed because Europe buy their gas from Russia, but it has to go through Ukraine's pipes. Long story short, eventually it was switched back on and Ukraine agreed to pay. But the political factors affect it massively. Climate, if it isn't sunny, you can't have solar power. If it isn't windy, you can't have wind turbines. And finally, technology as well. If you don't have the technology to do things like fracking, you can't access those reserves if they are underground. What are the impacts of high energy insecurity? If a country is really, really insecure, where are they going to get all that energy from? First one, conflict. There's a bit about Russia there, but conflict's going to occur. occur. That's why we went to war in, with Iraq all to do with energy insecurity. We were desperate for that oil, so we had to go in and invade, essentially. Rise in the price. If, we're ha if we are demanding oil that much for our cars, it makes sense for the price to go up because the demand's going up and there's not enough supply. This one, the pharmaceutical industry. Oil is massively used in medicine. If we don't have enough oil, are we going to be able to create all the medicine? That is an impact of energy and security. And finally, food production. Cows just don't all of a sudden become burgers and mincemeat. It's got to be made in a factory which uses power. That power, if we don't have the power, the impact is a reduction of our food supply. What is a fossil fuel? It is a source of energy that has a finite resource. We're talking about oil, gas, coal, and nuclear power. Sorry, new, yeah. Um, yeah, nuclear power. However, I'm going to come to this one in a second because, because there's so much of this and a tiny little bit of nuclear power produces so much energy. It's, it, is, it, is, and it is going to run out eventually, but not in anyone's lifetime soon. 
what are the impacts of heavily polluting fossil fuels then? If we're going to be using more oil and more coal and more gas, look at the impact it's having on our health. Asthma, bronchitis, this is called desertification. If we're producing more CO2 in our atmosphere, the rate of climate change will increase, more greenhouse gases will be trapped in our atmosphere, the temperature will go up, land will become desertified. Crop yields, farming may decrease, sea levels may rise and people may become flooded. And more importantly, lots of animals may go extinct if we're using fossil fuels and the temperature is increasing. How can we meet demand elsewhere other than, um, other than that then? We can frack, but sir, that's using gas. Yes, it is, but gas is less polluting than coal. That's good. However, it, is, it can cause earthquakes. It can also contaminate water supplies. Not good at all. Nuclear power. Nuclear power could quite easily meet demand with the click of our fingers if we built a few power stations. Only bad thing is though, think about Japan, think about Chernobyl, great TV program if you're watching it in a minute. If the nuclear power leaks, it can cause devastation, it can cause mutations, it can cause cancer, it can cause people to essentially die. And it did, a little bit did escape in Japan recently, I think in 2014. The risk, people think that the risks don't outweigh the benefits. However, it pretty much could meet global demand if done well. But re people really are against it. And once it's up, it's fair, once it's up and running, it's also fairly cheap. You can though use things renewable, solar power, wind, geothermal, hydropower, all these things which are non-polluting and you can pick them to, to, fit, to fit the bill. We use wind power because we're a windy country. Australia uses, Australia and parts of uh, California and America use solar because they get so much sun. Geothermal, Iceland do it because the they're, um, they're magma's quite close to the surface. How can homes become more sustainable? Insulating our lofts. Insulating our lofts will save us on our bills. It will reduce the need to heat so it will reduce demand so less energy needs to be made you might have an energy efficient boiler energy efficient boiler you might have energy saving light bulbs which again tell me about it fully they are cheaper to run they use less energy um, and finally, what was the other one that I wanted to go through on this one? Uh, solar panels. You can install solar panels on your roof to bring down your bills again and also reduce and double glazing windows, like we said early. Effic efficient appliances, yeah. So buying, uh, getting new, modern appliances which use less electricity. Nearly there, ladies and gents. Why is it difficult, I think this is the last slide, why is it difficult for LICs such as Nepal to adapt to sustainable energy? Why is it hard for Nepal to have things like solar power, wind power? Because it's expensive. Look where Nepal is. Nepal is between India and China. It is a very, very mountainous country, very, very high up. It is also landlocked and it has a limited supply of oil, coal, and gas. Therefore, how on earth is it going to generate energy? Because it's got a problem. I, want, I thought I had another picture here, but if I showed you a map of Nepal there, we know that in Nepal, it's geography, it has lots of rivers like this. It has rivers all across the country, which makes hydropower, 
a perfect investment. Can I just say, you need to know an example of a renewable energy scheme in an LIC, and this is it. It is micro hydropower. This is it, micro hydropower. What they do is, if this is a river channel, humans dig out a section to the left or right hand side and they build what I can only describe really as a big plug hole which will suck water down there. In there, there will be a turbine which turns. As the water goes and turns the turbine, this micro hydro, the small hydropower station, can power farm machinery. So farmers high up in the mountains or anywhere can power and produce, uh, you know, produce crops more efficiently. It can also generate electricity for homes. But ladies and gents, this is important because like this diagram shows here, you can do it across the country and it is cheaper because it is micro hydropower and it is in Nepal. That is, ladies and gents, a solid hour and 54, it says down there. That is it. Tomorrow's exam, Wednesday the 5th of June. It is in the afternoon after the Spanish exam in the morning. It is on urban world in the UK. You've learned about Rio and London. It is on development in the economic world. Nigeria in the UK economy. Finally, it is on resource management. We have taught you about energy. However, question three may ask you about food and water also. You need to know all three briefly and one of them in detail. Um, the last thing, these are, I'll leave this on for the last few minutes. Um, these are the key elements which we feel have a higher chance of coming up. We can't bank on it, we can't guarantee it. But looking through, um, these are the key elements. Um, so I will leave that on for the last few minutes while I just catch up with Miss Morrissey at the back of the classroom to see if there are any questions um, that need answering. Thank you very much, Year 11. Um, we're going to log off now. If you've got any further questions, like last time, please don't hesitate to shoot myself or Miss Morrissey an email. Uh, we'll endeavour to answer them tonight if it did come through. Um, otherwise, we will see you tomorrow at, I believe, it is 11.45 to 12.45 for the Geography Booster. Um, roomings are up already downstairs in the heart space. Um, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye.